Good morning, church. It's a uh, wonderful day, and uh, thank God for another life that uh, He gave us today. And so glad to see everybody. So this morning, um, we're going to discuss again about rejection. You know, as we have said, um, failure is not really fun at all. And uh, it really hurts us. And, you know, so does rejection. It hurts everybody. Failure is not something that a person dreams of, right? We dream of success. Failure or rejection is not something that the person lives for. We live for approval. We live for acceptance, right? And as we did talk about it last week, we cannot live a rejectionless life. Everybody experience rejection one way or another. Now, as human being, God created us with emotions. He created us with feelings. And part of that feeling or part of our feeling is the feeling of disappointment, the feeling of anger. Right? However, as normal as it is to feel you know, this way, let not these emotions lead us to hopelessness. Let not these emotions or feelings lead us to question our abilities and belittle ourselves, belittle our capabilities. And let not these events of unfortunate events, rejections, failures, question our faith in God and eventually lead us to deny God's sovereignty in our lives. You know, rather, let us uh, use these so-called unfortunate events to fuel your desire, to fuel our desire even more to be better and cultivate a relationship with God. And therefore, as we grow more and more better and as we cultivate our relationship with God, we seal our faith in God even more, as they say, tighter, you know. However, the choice is ours. How we will look at it, how you're going to look at it. And uh, if we truly believe in God's sovereignty, we will believe that God has a plan for us no matter what. If you will open your Bible from Genesis to Revelation, written across the pages of the Bible, God indeed has a plan for his people. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 7, if we truly believe that we are God's creation, servant, God said, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. If we claim that we belong to God, then no matter what happens to our life, be it may be we be rejected many times, our purpose, your purpose, is to glorify God. You are created for God's glory. We must never, ever forget about that, my dear brethren. We will move with our lives, you know, heads held up high and continuously doing what we're supposed to do as men and women of God. Now, your failures and your rejections, my failures and my rejections, must not equate to rejecting God. Let us learn uh, from the Israelites' example. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6, it says, now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. As we continue, 1 Corinthians 10, 7 to 10, do not be idolaters. What they did during or in the wilderness, they become idolaters. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. 
And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by destroying an angel. You see, the people of God, the Israelites, they kept complaining in the wilderness that God led them out of Egypt to die in the wilderness. So they kept thinking that God had abandoned them and left them out in the wilderness from out of Egypt to die in the wilderness. Now, so their response was an abomination to God. They went to what? Idolatry. They turned to other gods. They were giving themselves to sexual immorality and they paid for it dearly with their lives. Many people died at the time. They put the Lord to the test and they were killed. It means that they doubted God. They doubted the sovereignty of God. They mocked God to his face and demanded God to prove himself to them. But you know what, brethren's brethren, you know, God is not in any way. He is not in any way obligated to prove himself to anybody. That is his sovereignty. And finally, it says they grumble. They grumble against God. They murmur against God. And again, what happened? They were killed. That's why these things were written so that we will not commit the same mistakes these people did, according to what we have read. Now, they were God's people, but they forgot who they were, and they turned their backs on God. Again, it was repeated in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. These things happened to them as example and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So now, my dear brethren and friends, we are warned by God. It's not only once that he mentioned this, but twice. The warning is mentioned twice. It means that it is utmost importance from us not to do the same thing what the Israelites did. Now today, we will study further about being rejected, about our perspective on rejection and failure. Last week, we talked about rejection perspective, and we will continue with our rejection perspective. How should a man and women of God look at failures and rejections? Rejection is God's characterization. Now, what do I mean by that? What do I mean when rejection or failure is God's characterization? Now, more often, rejection is a way of rebuilding, rebuilding our character, getting us back to the right track. You know, when a person is so accustomed of being accepted, look up to, being admired, you know, it is easy to lose our grip on humility. When you are so up there and people are looking at you and then you have the accolades, you have the admiration of the people, it's easy to lose our ground on humility. It's easy to lose our firm grip on humility. When everything always comes in our favor, it is like whatever we touch turns into gold, so to speak. You know, arrogance, arrogance can easily replace humility in our hearts. We start to think that, you know, we are our abilities. We are better than other people. We start to think highly of our own abilities rather than think that God's grace and favor brought everything to us. Whatever you have right now, that is God's grace and favor. Now, some people, you know, they thank God. Now, don't get me wrong. When you receive something, we thank God. When we receive something big, we thank God. And that is good. You know, we, we always say, wow, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful blessing. Wow, thank you, Lord, for giving me this million contract. Right? Now, the problem is, my dear brethren and friends, after thanking God, what do you do? What do most people do? When they receive, you know, like, for example, a million contract, they celebrate. We celebrate, right? We celebrate, you know. We throw in a big celebration we normally call Thanksgiving. Now, in that Thanksgiving, what do you have? What do most people have? They will have booze. They will have women. And everything that God forbids. You know, in reality, my dear brethren, where is God in that so-called Thanksgiving. He's not there. We don't even come close to glorifying God when we do, when most people do their Thanksgiving. We are actually mocking God and being arrogant in God. You know, our lips are just the ones worshiping God, but not our hearts. Isaiah 29, 13. Our, our lips are just the one worshiping God, but not our beings. We come to God with our mouths claiming we are of God, but in reality, we are not of His because our hearts are far from Him. Many people, their hearts are far from the Lord. You see, just like the warnings that we read, it made us idolaters. It made us idolaters. Idolatry is when you replace something, you know, when, 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 when we replace something for God in our hearts and made that something the center of our life, that is idolatry. When we put something first that pleases our own sinful desire rather than putting God first and pleasing Him, that is idolatry. It is easy to forget sometimes, or more often, when you are so blessed, when, when, you, when you have everything. It is easy to forget the giver of the blessings, when we always have it our way and become comfortable with it. Now, rejection is a way of God's humbling us. Sometimes we need to feel the pain again. To learn that we are created by God and as such, we are at His mercy and in no way higher than God. Now, even to think that we are better than others is so much arrogance in itself. You know, and, and, and that is enough for God to humble us. Matthew 23 verse 12. People think they are better than others. <clears throat> will be humble. If you think <clears throat> that you are better than other people and humiliate them, then that's arrogance in God. And you will be humbled by God. But people who humble themselves will be made great. Now, can, we, can, can you imagine what God can do to you if we bring our arrogance to Him? He will definitely humble you. Now, let us look at the story of Hagar. You know, when, when Sarah had born, the, when, uh, had not born Abraham a son, Sarah told Abraham you know, to sleep with her slave, Hagar. Now, Abraham and Hagar, you know, they slept. And Hagar bore him a son named Ishmael. Now, in verse 4 of Genesis chapter, uh, chapter 16, tells us what become of the character of Hagar. Then he had relations with Hagar, referring to Abraham, and she conceived. And when Hagar became aware that she had conceived, her mistress was insignificant in her sight. Now, all of a sudden, here is Hagar. He treats her mistress as insignificant. Hagar, all of a sudden, began despising her mistress, Sarah, because she conceived a child for Abraham. 
she became proud. She became proud of her advantage over Sarah, you know, forgetting her role in the household of Sarah and Abraham being a slave. And he thought to herself, Sarah is insignificant. He became arrogant. You know? And he acted as if she wanted to, you know, to kick Sarah out of the house and become Abraham's, so to speak, wife and change places. You know? Now, what happened next? Sarah, in verse 6, Sarah dealt with Hagar so harshly and rejected Hagar until Hagar ran off, ran away from Sarah because she became arrogant. Now, in verse 7 and verse 8, the angel of the Lord found Hagar beside a spring of water in the wilderness along the road to Shur. And he said in verse 8, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from? And where are you going? I'm running away from my Mr. Sarai, she answered. You know, the angel made it clear that Sarah or Hagar was a slave to Sarah. The angel asked, where have you come from? Now, we can look at this as a symbolic, so to speak, question of identity. Who she was in the household of Abraham, because she came from the household of Abraham. She ran away. So the angel wanted her somehow to realize that in the household of Abraham and Sarah, she was a slave. And what did the angel told Sarah or Hagar to do? In verse 9, the angel of the Lord said to her, Return, you go back to your mistress and do what? Submit to her authority. Romans chapter 5, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. For we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength in what? Strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. You know, rejection is God's characterization in us so that we remember to keep our feet on the ground. Always. God wants you to go back to where you came from. To go back to being a slave of God. To go back to being a servant of God rather than the arrogant in God. So rejection, it is God's characterization in you because it does not want you to suffer. Now, you can look at it as God's re redirection. You can look at your failure as God's redirection. Rejection is God's redirection. If we truly believe in the Almighty God, then we can always conclude that God knows the best for you. Do you believe that? Can I have an amen to that? Can I have an amen to that? Amen. God knows if you truly are a servant of God and living a Christ-centered life, you will believe that God knows what's the best for you. Now, let us take a look at the, the life of Joseph. Joseph the dreamer in Genesis in the Old Testament. What happened to him? <clears throat> you can read this in Genesis chapter 37, 38, 39, you know, and so on. In Genesis 37, Joseph, he was hated and he was despised by his brothers. He was rebuked by his father. His brothers plotted to kill him. He was stripped of his robe and thrown into a cistern. He was sold <clears throat> to the Midianite merchants. His brothers, you know, they fake his death. They fake his death and they lied to their father. And he was sold. Potiphar by the Midianite. 
and then he was wrongfully accused of sexual immorality with Potiphar's wife because Potiphar's wife wanted to wanted Joseph to lie down with him or with her but Joseph declined many times so he was accused wrongfully and he was in prison you know Joseph's life if you will look at it is a misfortune over uh, one after another one after another. Now, he was rejected by his own brothers. Can you imagine? Now, the question is, did Joseph, did Joseph know what will become of him? Did he know that all of these things will lead him to become a political figure? No. No. He does not know everything about it. Only God knows his plan for him. Now, it was only many years when Joseph understood that it was God's leading. Now, if there will be one biblical figure that I uh, admire most, of course, aside from Jesus Christ, it will be Joseph. His humility, you know, is like, Jesus Christ, in Isaiah 53, verse 7, referring to Jesus Christ, you know, Jesus never did say anything. He did not badmouth the Romans or anybody that hurt him. Now, the same goes for Joseph. Joseph never did say anything or fought back or even think or even plan in his mind some evil things against his brothers. No. He did not. And even to Potiphar's wife, even he was, when he was wrongfully accused, he never did think of going back at them. Instead, he trusted God and feared God. As Genesis 39 puts it, there is no one more important in this house than I, referring to Joseph himself. And he has held nothing from me except you, referring to Potiphar, or the wife of Potiphar. Because you are his wife. How then could I do this sinful thing and sin against God? He feared God all his life. Now, Joseph's conviction is larger than life. Larger than life. You know, Joseph could have been resentful, filled with bitterness and hatred toward his brothers and Potiphar's wife for all that they did. Well, even maybe to God. You could have got angry with God. Lord, what have you done to me? I've been faithful all these years, and now look at what happened to me. All these misfortunes, all these rejections. He could have been angry with God, but he did not. You know, he could have chosen that path. Rather, he chose another path, and that is the path of humility. That is the path of bowing down to God. His larger-than-life conviction to God was even more manifested as he just accepted everything that happened to him with all humility and just pure obedience to God. Now, then it happened. While in prison, the king's cupbearer <clears throat> and the king's bread, the king's bread maker were with him, and they both had a dream. Now, Joseph interpreted both of their dreams, and it was revealed as, well, it was revealed to him by God, of course. Now, the cup bearer, he was uh, reinstalled in the king's service. He went back in serving the king, but the bread maker was killed. Now, then Pharaoh, in turn, had a dream, and nobody was able to explain the Pharaoh's dream. Now the cup bearer remembered Joseph. And Joseph was summoned by the king, by the Pharaoh. Now Joseph interpreted the king's dream. And then from there, he rose to power. As we can read in Genesis chapter 41, 39 to 42. Now when Joseph became the second in command, in the entire Egypt, the famine came. 
the famine came seven years. Then Joseph uttered one of the most beloved verses in the Bible. In Genesis chapter 45, verse 5, But now, do not therefore grieve or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. He was talking to his brothers. For God sent me before you to preserve life. And in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, But as for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good. Wow. Amen. God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people. Hallelujah. What a turn of events, right? What a turn of events. Now, surely, um, luck has turned into Joseph's favor. But you know what? Luck has nothing to do with it. Luck has nothing to do with it. You know why? It was all God. Amen. It was all God. How do you spell awesome? G O D. <laughs> it was God's redirection. Amen. It was this moment in Joseph, in Joseph's life, that he learned that God truly planned everything from the start. That's why he said God meant it good. God was redirecting everything and turning it into a blessing at the end. Whenever we fail, whenever we are rejected, don't think of it as something bad or evil. Now, may I encourage you to perhaps think of it as God's blessing. God's redirecting your path to what is better for you. You just have to trust God no matter what. Rejection is God's protection. You know, just short. Egypt, Canaan. And they say that it's 600 miles. If you're going to walk, they say that it will take you six weeks to walk for the Israelites to, to cross uh, uh, Egypt to Canaan, if you do a straight line. But it took them so many years, right? You know, because from the beginning, the Israelites, they grumbled with God. They kept complaining, murmuring against God. You know? And why did God choose the long path rather than the short path? In Exodus chapter 13, verse 7, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road to Philistine country. Though that was shorter, there was a shorter route. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt, ready for battle. And that is the reason why they did not go straight. They did not took the short route because God made it happen that they would take to the desert and down to the Red Sea. Because God knew when they take the, uh, the shorter route and face the might of the Philistines, what will they do? They will go running back to Egypt. They will be slaves again. And look at that. You know what? God, he is a, uh, God is a, uh, a war strategist. Let me. God is a war strategist. That is the Red Sea, where they all cross. You know, God used the Red Sea to protect the nation of Israel. If they go the shorter route, the land is barren, and they can easily be rounded up. And they can be easily defeated. 
So God made it happen that they should walk or cross the Red Sea. God uses the Red Sea to defeat the Egyptians. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? God planned everything. God planned everything. God doesn't want the entire nation to be infected, you know, by the epidemic of arrogance. Because in the wilderness, the people, they, 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 they argue with God. They, they argue with God. You know, and why it took them 40 years until they wandered. They wandered around here for 40 years. They are actually close to Canaan. Why? Why? In Numbers 32, the Lord's anger burned against Israel and he made them wander in the wilderness for 40 years until the whole generation of those who had done evil in his sight was gone. It was purging time for God. Because again, as I have said, God doesn't want the entire nation of Israel to be infected by the epidemic of arrogance. They become arrogant. God doesn't want the entire nation of Israel to be infected by the epidemic of stiff-necked people, stubbornness, and idolatry. And after that, it will be a fresh new start in Canaan with flowing milk and honey. You know, whenever we fail or get rejected, don't think of it as punishment from God. Again, may I encourage you to perhaps think of it as God's blessings. God's protecting you from running into direct trouble. Now, my question is, can you see what's behind closed door? No. Nobody can see it except God. Have the patience to wait for the better that God has a store for you. You just have to trust God no matter what. No matter what. Now, our scripture reading tells us we know that God causes everything to work together for good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. There are two prerequisites in this verse so we can understand the meaning of Romans 8.28. Number one is that it says, for those who love God. If you love God <clears throat> the way Joseph did, the way the apostles did, you will understand the way of God if you truly love him. We don't expect those who don't love God to understand his way. I don't expect those who don't love God truly to understand God's way. But if you truly love God, you will understand God's way. <clears throat> when you truly love God, God will love you back. He will love you back. And you don't, even if you love somebody, when you love somebody, you will seek their welfare. And what's the best for them? How much more, you know, God would give and love you back. In Matthew 7, 11, if you're then evil as you are, know how to give good and advantageous gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven? Now, the next prerequisite is that we are called according to his purpose. God's purpose in all of us is for his glory. For his glory. We are called to be obedient, full submission to God and to his will. If you obey God the way Joseph did, the way the apostles did, you know, you will understand the way of God. Now, we don't, we don't expect those who don't try to read and study the Bible, the word of God, to fully understand his ways. True obedience can only come through true love for God. Now, my dear brethren, the next time when you are rejected or you face failures, you may want to look at it as God's building your character. You may want to look at it as God's redirection for a better future. You may look at it as God's protecting you from inevitable danger. Now, finally, I will leave you with Psalm chapter 84, verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. He withholds no good. I will repeat that. 
He withholds no good thing from those who walk with integrity. My dear brethren and friends, the gospel is yours. May I invite those who have not yet accepted the Lord to come forward and accept the Lord and receive God's blessing and ultimately receive God's salvation in heaven. He prepared for everyone that will come to him with full humility and with genuine love for him. God bless you and your brothers and sisters. And for those who join us in Zoom, God be with you. Shall we all stand up as we sing the song of invitation?